Hi, my name is Jeff Weiss. I'm a partner in the International Trade Group at Venable in Washington, D.C. And welcome to this webinar on regulatory coherence, a comparative analysis of Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru, and the United States. This webinar is the result of an initiative undertaken by the Advanced Medical Technology Association, Advimet as part of the U.S. Agency for International Development's Standards Alliance project, which is overseen by the American National Standards Institute. The goal of this initiative is to promote regulatory coherence, including central coordination and good regulatory practices, and to provide capacity building and assistance to the governments of targeted developing countries in Latin America, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and the CAFTA DR countries. This initiative has two components, tier one and tier two. Tier one is a regulatory coherence initiative, which is horizontal and cross-sectoral. Tier two is about promoting regulatory coherence in the medical device sector specifically. This webinar is part of tier one. As part of tier one, we've developed a formal internationally benchmarked manual and implementation guide for policymakers to legally codify and implement foundational regulatory coherence policies in the project countries. Next, we conducted an assessment of the existing regulatory coherence policies in four of those countries, Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, plus the United States, against the manual and implementation guide. Based on that assessment, we've developed a gap analysis report for each country in English and Spanish and a flowchart demonstrating the life cycle of a typical regulation in each country. This particular webinar compares and contrasts our findings regarding the project countries and the United States with respect to their policies on regulatory coherence. But first, let's have a brief overview of regulatory coherence. Regulatory coherence refers to the degree of central coordination and review under which the whole of government works to ensure that regulations and regulatory policy reflect good regulatory practices or GRPs. Regulatory coherence is important because it promotes better regulatory outcomes. It enhances the legitimacy and predictability of a regulatory system, and it avoids creating unnecessary obstacles to trade and unnecessary regulatory differences with major trading partners. Regulatory coherence has two main components, central coordination and GRPs. First, central coordination. In order to ensure that all of the GRPs are well understood and followed across agencies, it's critical that a government have a central coordination and oversight body or mechanism responsible for managing the regulatory process and ensuring adherence to a published set of good regulatory practices that are endorsed at the political level, applied government-wide, and revised over time as best practices evolve, which they often do. Such a body can also ensure that there is political level buy-in and accountability on a whole of government strategy for regulatory reform that sets up clear objectives, establishes an effective implementation mechanism to coordinate and manage the strategy, and emphasizes the importance of a marketplace that is open and pro-competitive, facilitates investment, and rewards innovation. GRPs, the second part of regulatory coherence, ensure that regulations are high quality and evidence-based and crafted in an open, transparent, and participatory manner. GRPs include things like regulatory forecasting, regulatory impact assessment, requesting public comments and taking them into account, assessing international trade impacts of regulation, and ex post review. This is a very high level overview of central coordination and GRPs. For a fuller discussion, please watch the webinar on major elements of regulatory coherence, which is posted on the Standards Alliance website.
before we delve into a discussion of regulatory coherence in the project countries and the United States, let's first look at some of the key drivers for countries looking to improve their regulatory systems. And we'll talk about some of the internal drivers and then some of the external drivers. So in terms of the internal drivers, uh, countries want to have better regulations. Uh, they want to have regulations with uh, that are supported by better analysis, where there's been more transparency, because that leads to improved environmental health and safety protection for their citizens. It also helps them to grow their economies, attract investment, promote innovation, and not stifle the growth of small businesses. For many countries in the region, a more transparent regulatory system that focuses on reduction of unnecessary administrative touches, costs, and or complexity is also consistent with efforts to combat corruption. Eliminating any unnecessary paperwork, reporting, or other transactions reduces opportunities for corruption. And then when designing a regulatory system, resource issues may drive the scope of coverage and the substance of obligations. So if you're just starting to build your regulatory system and building the regulatory coherence elements into it, you probably aren't going to be able to review every rule or review every rule with the same amount of scrutiny. So you need to prioritize, get some experience and build up from there. So those are some of the internal drivers. Uh, turning now to some of the key external uh, drivers for regulatory coherence. Uh, compliance with WTO rules has been a big one. For example, the WTO Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade or the TBT Agreement. The TBT Agreement covers what are known as technical regulations. Technical regulations are product regulations, rules that set out product characteristics, related processes and production methods, related labeling and packaging requirements, and any applicable administrative provisions. The TBT agreement also covers standards, which are voluntary, as well as conformity assessment procedures, which are procedures used to determine that the relevant requirements in technical regulations or standards are met. And conformity assessment procedures include testing, inspection, registration, certification, accreditation, and combinations of those procedures. The TBT agreement requires, for example, that countries not use such regulations to discriminate against products from other countries or between products from other countries. That they put in place regulations that take the least trade restrictive approach to achieving their legitimate regulatory objectives. That they use relevant international standards as a basis for the regulations. And that they develop such regulations through a transparent process in which they provide a meaningful opportunity for comment and take those comments into account. So as a result of the TBT agreement disciplines, we found that in the project countries, there was more central coordination and more adherence to GRPs when it comes to the development of technical regulations than for the development of other types of regulation. This was especially true for transparency, but in other areas as well. And we'll see that time and time again when we discuss the findings in a webinar. Another key driver is that several countries in Latin America and South America are seeking to accede to the OECD. And the OECD has been encouraging countries seeking membership to improve their regulatory processes, especially in the area of regulatory analysis, which goes beyond, but is consistent with the TBT agreement requirements. Lastly, the major influencers for countries in the region looking to improve their regulatory systems are the United States and the United Kingdom. And within the region, it's Mexico and CONAMER, which is Mexico's central coordinating authority for regulation. So now let's look at central coordination in the project countries and the United States. Central coordination is still in its infancy and evolving in many of the countries in the region. Generally, we found three different organizational structures for central coordination in these countries, although the lines between them can be blurry. So first, some countries have one central coordinating body, 
Other countries have one primary central coordinating body with a second agency and a strong supporting role for technical regulations. And then other countries have no central coordinating body, but there are several bodies or entities performing coordination functions. So turning to the first category, one central coordinating body, the United States is clearly in this category. The Office of Information and Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, which is located within the White House Office of Management and Budget, is the central coordinating body for the United States for regulation. Second category is one central coordinating body with a second agency and a strong supporting role for technical regulations. Now, Mexico might fall in this category. Mexico's central coordinating body, as mentioned before, is CONAMER, and its name was recently changed from COFAMER, uh, so it's moved from federal to national. Uh, its powers have potentially been enhanced at the federal level as well as state and local levels in Mexico as a result of the new general law on regulatory improvement. GGN, the General Directorate for Norms or Standards, manages the national standardization process. In Mexico, this includes the development of NOMs or official Mexican norms. NOMs are mandatory technical standards that are technical regulations under the WTO TBT agreement definition. However, NOMs need to be viewed through CONAMER's process so you could make an argument that Mexico belongs in the first category, because even though DGN has a very strong role, the norms still need to go through CONAMER. Both CONAMER and DGN are part of the Ministry of Economy in Mexico. In Costa Rica, the central coordinating body is the Regulatory Improvement Office inside the Ministry of Economy, Industry and Commerce, otherwise known as DMR. DMR oversees regulatory development in Costa Rica. However, there is a separate regulatory development process for technical regulations in Costa Rica, and this is run by the Technical Regulation Office, or ORT. ORT is an interministerial commission that is attached to the Ministry of Economy. Costa Rica also has a regulatory improvement commission that has a role in retrospective review. So now let's turn to the third category of central coordination, which is countries with no single central coordinating body, but with several bodies performing coordination functions. And Colombia and Peru fall into this bucket. In Peru, there are three bodies or entities with a role in central coordination. First, you have the presidency of the Council of Ministers, PCM. PCM plays a lead role in the regulatory review process. Second is the Multi-Sectorial Regulatory Quality Commission, or CCR, which was established in July 2017. It is chaired by PCM and is comprised of PCM, the Ministry of Economy, and the Ministry of Justice. CCR coordinates regulatory quality policy, reviewing proposed rules, and overseeing the new ex post review process in Peru. The third entity, is the Vice Ministerial Coordinating Council, or CCV, which is comprised of 35 participating vice ministers. CCV reviews proposals that involve the equities of three or more agencies. So that's, that's Peru. Now in Colombia, there are four entities with a role in central coordination. The Regulatory Improvement Group, or OMR, within the National Planning Department could become the central coordinating body for Colombia at some point, but at the moment it doesn't review regulations. It drafted and is implementing Colombia's regulatory improvement policy, much of which follows the recommendations of a 2013 OECD report. It is developing an electronic portal for commenting on regulations, which is called SUCO, that should be operational by the end of 2018. And OMR is also drafting a decree that would likely require agencies to prepare an RIA for high-impact rules and give OMR the authority to analyze ex-ante and ex-post RIAs and issue non-binding recommendations. Second, Function Publica has regulatory oversight of proposed regulations that add or modify an administrative burden, and it can issue binding recommendations as part of the review process. 
third agency is the Ministry of Commerce, Industry, and Tourism, or MINCIT. MINCIT has regulatory oversight of proposed regulations that have an international impact or are proposed technical regulations or both. MINCIT can also issue binding opinions during the review process. The fourth body in Colombia with a role in central coordination is the Industry and Commerce Superintendencia, or SIC, which is Colombia's National Competition Authority. SIC is affiliated with MINCIT and has regulatory oversight of proposed regulations that have an impact on competition. In addition, the legal department of Colombia's Office of the President reviews all regulations and their accompanying analyses that require the president's signature before publication. So five countries, five very different ways of doing central coordination. Let's look at some of the other factors involved. So turning to location of the central coordinating authority. So in general, coordinating functions are generally uh, exercised by bodies within either economic ministries or ministries in charge of central government planning and or budgeting. So economic ministries, that's the case for Mexico and Costa Rica. Ministries in charge of central government planning and budgeting, that's the United States and Peru. And Colombia is trying to move towards the second model. All things being equal, in my experience, central planning ministries tend to have a greater chance for success with central coordination than economics ministries because central planning ministries tend to be closer to the president or prime minister's office and have more authority over regulatory agencies than economic ministries do. But an agency's ability to coordinate can be a function of multiple factors, including legal authority and political will. Looking at staffing for central coordination in these countries, Mexico has the most staff dedicated to this function by far. They have approximately 120 staff at Conamer. OIRA in the United States is next. Uh, OIRA employs approximately 45, uh, mostly civil servants. And both Conamer and OIRA have different subunits that focused on review of different types of regulation and employ staff to do economic analysis as well. Peru and Costa Rica employ less than a dozen staffers at CCR and DMR, respectively. Next, let's talk about the scope of central coordination. And again, this differs amongst the five countries. In Mexico, CONAMER reviews all regulations, and an RIA must be performed for any regulation that would add costs for citizens. And Mexico has an RIA calculator, which is completed by the regulating agency to determine the types of analyses that must be done and the level of review. RIAs can be low, medium, or high impact. And other analyses that may be required are risk impact analysis, competition impact analysis, and foreign trade impact analysis. In the United States, OIRA reviews regulations that are significant. OIRA determines significance based on published criteria in Executive Order 12866. Those criteria are as follows, economic significance which means a regulation having an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more or adversely affecting in a material way the economy, a sector of the economy, productivity, competition, jobs, the environment, public health or safety, or state, local, or tribal governments or communities. Second, a regulation that creates a serious inconsistency or otherwise interferes with an action taken or planned by another agency. Third, a regulation that materially alters the budgetary impact of entitlements, grants, user fees, or loan programs, or the rights and obligations of recipients. That could also be significant. The fourth category of regulations that could be significant are regulations that raise novel or legal policy issues arising out of legal mandates, the president's priorities, or U.S. regulatory principles. For economically significant rules, that's the first category, 
agencies need to draft an RIA for OIRA re review. An application of the significance task by OIRA can vary for a variety of reasons, including the state of the economy and the political calendar. Turning to Costa Rica, regulations subject to review are those that either add or modify an administrative burden, technical regulations, or both. In Peru, regulations subject to review are those that either add or modify an administrative burden, require the approval of three or more regulatory agencies, or both. Now in Colombia, only regulations that require the president's signature are subject to review. And the individual agencies make the call in terms of what rules they want to be decrees and therefore would be subject to review and what rules would have a lesser status. One key similarity is that all five countries have independent agencies and such agencies are generally not subject to central coordination or they're exempted from major elements of it. We also looked at each country's reviewing authority for regulations and whether it is binding or not. In the United States, OIRA has binding authority. OIRA has authority to review regulations before they can be published in the Federal Register and at both the proposed and final rule stages. So OIRA and interested interagency actors review the regulation twice. And this is unique among the five countries. OIRA's ability to obtain the changes it wants before it clears varies and depends on a variety of factors, some regulator specific and some related to the state of the economy and the political environment. In Mexico, Conamer's opinion on a draft regulation is technically non-binding. But if Conamer decides not to issue the opinion, the regulator cannot publish it in Mexico's official gazette. So in our view, it's effectively binding review. And that's before the general law on regulatory improvement entered into force. Because Conamer has been given stronger authority, not just at the federal level, but also at the sub-federal level through the general law on regulatory improvement. And we'll need to see how that is implemented, but a central coordinating body with a strong role at the state and local government levels would be unique. In Costa Rica, ORT's review is binding for technical regulations and DMR's review is binding for the issuance of other regulations. In Peru, there's also binding review. There are three sets of clearances that are needed for a regulation to be published. First, CCR reviews and issues a binding opinion for regulations that add or modify an administrative burden. Then, three other agencies review as part of the second step. The Ministry of Economy reviews for budgetary and economic impacts. The Ministry of Justice reviews for constitutionality and legality questions. And PCM reviews for consistency with guidelines for administrative simplification. Finally, at the third stage, CCV reviews, and each of the 35 participating ministries can raise issues that need to be resolved. In Colombia, there's no central review by the National Planning Department, but for decrees, two agencies issue binding opinions before the decrees can move forward. MINCIT on international trade and Function Publica on administrative burdens. SIC also needs to issue an opinion on competition issues, but that opinion is non-binding. Turning next to regulatory budgeting. Of the five countries we examined, this is only occurring at this point in the United States through executive order and in Mexico through the general law that we just mentioned. In the United States, this was implemented through an executive order in 2017, so it's relatively new, and it's unclear at this point whether subsequent administrations will attain it or how successful it will be. In Mexico, regulatory budgeting is also new. It's now required by the general law, which was signed in May 2018. 
So it will also take time to see how that's going to be implemented. But under the general law in Mexico, for every new rule, you need to modify or eliminate an existing rule, one in, one out. If you'd like to learn more about that, please review our analysis on Mexico's regulatory system and the accompanying webinar for more details. In the United States, for regulatory budgeting, it's one in and at least two out. Plus, each agency has an annual regulatory budget, meaning that it will negotiate with OIRA the total amount of incremental cost of regulations that it will be allowed each year. Lastly, with respect to international regulatory cooperation. In general, the lead on IRC is shared between central coordinating authorities and trade and economic ministries. Regulators work with their counterparts in other countries through those agencies or directly, sometimes both. Central coordinating authorities tend to focus on regulatory improvement discussions and initiatives between countries and in intergovernmental bodies and fora on GRPs, for example, in APEC and OECD. Trade and economics ministries tend to focus on regulatory and standards issues in trade agreements. So for example, at the WTO TBT committee, NAFTA, Pacific Alliance, and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP. So there you have it, five countries, five different coordination systems, with many of them in the process of implementing new elements. So it's going to be very interesting to see how things develop in the coming years. And again, if you'd like more detail on central coordination in Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico, and how those entities interact and their respective roles in regulatory development and policy, please review the analyses and webinars we've put together on each of those regulatory systems. So now that we've compared and contrasted the different approaches that these five countries have taken on central coordination, let's turn to the second part of regulatory coherence, GRPs, and let's start with regulatory forecasting. The regulatory forecast, or agenda, is a central electronic publication, ideally updated no less than every six months, of all planned and ongoing regulatory activity. What we found in our analysis is that some of the countries have an annual regulatory agenda and some of them don't. The United States has a regulatory plan, which is published annually, and a unified agenda of regulatory and deregulatory actions, which is published twice annually. The agenda sets out the details with respect to specific rules, and the plan sets out the overarching priorities and direction. Colombia also has an annual regulatory agenda, and when SUCOP is finished, agencies will need to post it there. The other three countries do not have an annual regulatory agenda, but there is some form of forecasting. So in Mexico, for example, GGN puts out an annual plan for NOMS and NMXs as part of the National Standardization Program. NOMs we've already discussed are technical regulations. NMXs are voluntary standards. In Costa Rica, the Ministry of Economy publishes a four-year national plan of technical regulations. And in TECO, Costa Rica's national standards body puts out an annual national standardization plan. In Peru, agencies are required to submit an annual strategic standardization plan to INACAO, Peru's national standards authority. The next GRP is maintaining a national regulatory register. A national regulatory register is a central electronic publication issued with regular frequency, usually daily or weekly, that solicits stakeholder input on all draft regulations and provides links to the full text of such regulations as well as their associated dockets. As you can see, all five countries have an official journal and several have an online portal for commenting on draft regulations. Costa Rica actually has two, Sucopre and Reglatec, for technical regulations in Costa Rica. Proposed and final rules are published in both Reglatec and the Diario Oficial. 
For other regulations, you comment through SICOPRE, and final regulations are published in the Diario Oficial. Mexico's online portal for draft regulations is Syria. And once Conamer issues its opinion on a regulation, the regulator publishes the final rule in Mexico's official gazette. In the United States, draft and final regulations are published in the Federal Register, and public comment is done through regulations.gov. As previously mentioned, Colombia's online portal, SUCOP, is under construction and should be ready by the end of the year. All proposed regulations will be available for comment there. Right now, proposed regulations in Colombia are published for comment on agency websites, and final regulations are published in the Diario. However, for technical regulations, both proposed and final regulations are published in the Diario. In Peru, there's no electronic portal. Proposed and final regulations are published in Peru's official gazette, El Peruano. Let's turn to the next GRP, which is providing an opportunity for public comment. So prior to putting a regulation in place, agencies need to publish the proposed text for comment on a timetable that allows stakeholders an adequate time to review the proposed text and a sufficient interval to respond. And publication should ideally be done electronically through a national regulatory register and if required, notified to the WTO. Ideally, the comment period would be at least 60 days and at least 90 days for proposed regulations involving complicated issues. So a few initial points here. First, none of the five countries we examined provide for public comment on legislation, just regulation. Second, there was one tool sometimes used by U.S. regulators, but not the others, and that's advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And this is a tool for when an agency is considering regulating in a new area. In some cases, the U.S. regulator will notify the public and request comment from interested stakeholders before any decisions to regulate are made and before any regulations are drafted and proposed. Third, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico may, and often do, consult with interested stakeholders in the regulatory development process, that is, before they publish a draft regulation for comment. And this may include establishing working groups to provide advice and help draft the regulation. The key trend from our analysis is that in general, there are different public comment requirements for technical regulations and non-technical regulations, with the United States being the exception. And let's set the U.S. aside for now and focus on the other four countries. So Costa Rica is actually the extreme case in terms of that dichotomy because Costa Rica maintains two separate regulatory review processes run by two different entities, one for technical regulations and one for other types of regulations. It's also important to note that for the project countries, the question of whether to notify a measure to, to the WTO is part of the development process of the reg. Again, because there are often different procedural requirements for technical regulations in those countries. And Mexico and Costa Rica have procedural safeguards in place to catch technical regulations. So, for example, in Mexico, most technical regulations are norms. But just to make sure that a general administrative act that might be technical regulation doesn't escape scrutiny, Regulators need to complete a foreign trade impact checklist for every rule and submit it to Conamer. Depending on the regulator's responses to the questions, the tool may indicate to the regulator that it needs to perform a foreign trade impact analysis and notify the measure to, to the WTO. If that's the case, the results are notified to DGN and Economia. In Costa Rica, when DMR is reviewing non-technical regulations, there's a stage at which it sends the draft rule to ORT for review. If ORT finds that the measure is a technical regulation and ORT's review here uh, is binding, the measure needs to go through ORT's review process and potentially be notified to the WTO. 
for Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico. And here's another interesting point. There are actually two public comment periods, a domestic comment process followed by a WTO comment process if the measure is a technical regulation. And this is typical in Peru as well, but sometimes the two comment processes can be done in parallel. With regard to public comment periods, comment periods for technical regulations tend to be much longer than for other types of regulations. So typically between 10 to 30 days for non-technical regulations versus between 60 and 90 days for technical regulations. And in Mexico, there's no required minimum comment period for general administrative acts, which are usually not technical regulations. Now let's talk about how these countries respond to stakeholder input and taking comments into account. And this is another key GRP, right? After proposed regulation has been published, before it's finalized, we want the regulatory process to require the regulator to evaluate the input it receives and modify the proposed regulation where the input supports changes. It's also important that when a rule is finalized, a regulator communicates the reasoning behind the changes that were made as a result of stakeholder input, as well as the rationale for proposed changes that were not made. Comments submitted by stakeholders should also be made publicly available online and the regulator's responses to significant comments it received on the proposed rule during the comment period should be published as well. And again, there is a distinction in some of these countries between how technical regulations and non-technical regulations are treated with respect to taking comments into account. In Colombia, regulators need to take comments on all regulations into account. There's no distinction between tech regs and non-tech regs. The comments will be posted on Sukop when that site becomes operational. Right now, the comments are published on agency websites along with responses to comments. In Mexico, regulators need to demonstrate to Conamer that they took comments into account and the comments are posted on Syria. But for a NOM, right, and NOMs are technical regulations, the regulators' responses to public comments are posted publicly in the NOMS catalog before the final NOM is published. In Costa Rica and Peru, taking comments into account is required for technical regulations, but not always for other regulations. Now in Costa Rica, for technical regulations, a regulator is required to develop a matrix of public comments and their responses. And this must be done for both the domestic and international comment periods, and the matrix needs to be published on Regulatech. Now let's come back to the United States. As I mentioned before, the United States is the exception. The internal rules governing regulatory review don't differentiate between technical regulations and non-technical regulations. USTR and, and or OMB have provided periodic reminders to agencies of their international obligations through guidance and now in OMB Circular A119, which sets out the policy on standards and conformity assessment. However, compliance is generally driven by other countries and stakeholders raising concerns, which then activates the agencies, including USTR. In addition, in the United States, whether or not to notify a measure to the WTO is generally not part of the regulatory process. Rather, the, the U.S. inquiry point for technical barriers to trade at the National Institute of Standards and Technology reviews the Federal Register every day and notifies the WTO if a proposed regulation is a technical regulation. As a result, domestic and international comments are solicited at around the same time, although there is a few days delay between when the measure is published in the Federal Register and when the official WTO notification is made. The U.S. system for soliciting public comment, just to give you a, a brief review, is a product of the Administrative Procedure Act and the requirement that interested parties be allowed to participate in the regulatory process, which is known in the U.S. as notice and comment. Under Executive Order 12866, which we mentioned earlier, 
The comment period for proposed rules should be at least 60 days. However, it's often 30 days, although it could be longer than 60 days for complex rulemakings. In the preamble of a proposed regulation, which contains the draft regulatory text, agencies must discuss their legal authority, provide a summary of the regulatory provisions, and describe potential alternatives they considered. Comments must be taken into account. Responses to comments and the discussion of changes that were made or not made, along with the justifications, must be provided in the preamble of the final regulation. The final regulation needs to be a logical outgrowth of the proposed regulation and administrative record and not arbitrary and capricious. If the regulator wants to proceed with an alternative approach to the regulation that was not discussed in the proposal, it will need to request comment again through a supplementary notice of proposed rulemaking. References to standards and regulation must be static. You cannot reference a standard in a regulation as it may be subsequently amended, because in that case, you would be effectively inhibiting the ability of stakeholders to comment on the regulation. So agencies need to periodically modify their rules to include updated versions of standards. Lastly, the administrative record, which is available online, must contain all and only the documents relied upon by the regulator. And that includes comments, the RIA and other analyses, any supporting data and studies, notes from public hearings, and meetings with outside parties. The next GRP is publication of evidence and conducting a regulatory analysis. It's not enough to simply publish a proposed rule online. It is also important to share with interested stakeholders the data that supports the draft rule, as well as the regulatory impact assessment or other regulatory analyses that guided the regulator's initial determination. To the extent feasible, this information should be made available to interested stakeholders online. With respect to RIAs, all regulations produce benefits and costs, but only the regulations where the benefits justify the costs should be finalized. Governments should require that agencies develop RIAs, which improve regulatory quality and regulator accountability for significant regulations. Providing guidance to regulators on RIAs, for instance, providing common, clear, and transparent methodologies for agencies to use when calculating costs and benefits and assessing impact is critical. So that's the GRP. So as an initial point, all regulators, as part of their analysis, need to explain their legal authority to regulate. We found that across the board. And for all five of the countries we examined, it's the same. Regulators are either instructed to regulate by legislation or legislation provides them with general authority to regulate in a particular area and they initiate the regulatory process pursuant to that authority. With respect to RIA, they need to be drafted for many measures in Costa Rica, Mexico, and the United States. So in Costa Rica, regulations that would add or modify an administrative burden need to have an RIA. So administrative burden is the trigger. In Mexico, it's regulations that would impose costs on citizens that require an RIA. In the United States, it's regulations that are economically significant that need an RIA. Use of RIA is evolving in Peru and Colombia. In Peru, an RIA is required as part of the description of motivation that has to accompany regulations, but in practice, it is only done sporadically. And in Colombia, RIAs became a requirement for technical regulations as of January 2018. So this is relatively new. A decree to cover other regulations with an RIA requirement is under development. Mexico has a unique system for RIA that's worth mentioning, and that is the RIA calculator. Regulators in Mexico use a series of online tools that determine the type of RIA to perform, and they submit those results to CONAMER. There are four checklists that correspond to different types of analyses. 
First, the regulator uses the regulatory impact calculator to identify, for example, all expected impacts of the draft regulatory measure, the number of affected parties, and the number of years over which impacts are expected to occur. Based on the answers provided, the calculator indicates to the regulator what type of RIA it must perform, low, medium, or high. Second, you have the competition impact checklist. That requires the agency to answer questions that are designed to determine whether the draft measure limits the number or range of suppliers, the ability of suppliers to compete, or the choices and information available to consumers. The risk impact checklist requires the regulator to answer questions to determine whether the draft measure is designed to reduce risks for human, animal, or plant health, public security, labor hazards, the environment, or consumer protection. And then fourth, the foreign trade impact checklist requires the regulator to answer questions to determine the impact that the draft regulation may have on international trade by taking into account things like international standards, guidelines or recommendations, and international commitments such as those contained in the WTO or bilateral and regional free trade agreements. The results of those four tools indicate which analyses a regulator must conduct, and there are many possible variations. It could be one, two, three, or all four of these analyses, and the regulatory impact analysis can be low, medium, or high. So there's three different types of impact analysis under the first checklist. The RIA manual developed by Kofamer sets out the different types of RIA and the specific required elements of each. In addition, Conamer can require that a regulator perform a high-impact RIA even if the results of the calculator do not show that an RIA is needed. So they maintain that discretion. And the test for an RIA in Mexico is that the benefits must exceed the costs. In the United States, policy on RIAs is set out in Executive Order 12866 and OMB Circular A4. And the governing principle is to maximize net benefits to society, or at least to ensure that benefits justify costs. So in the US, it's benefits justify costs. In Mexico, it's benefits must exceed costs. So it's a stricter standard. In the US, the RIA needs to contain a statement of need, analyses of the benefits of proposed action, the costs of proposed action, and the benefits and costs of alternatives, and an explanation for the selected alternative. In addition, the Regulatory Flexibility Act requires a regulator to consider the impact of a draft regulation on small entities and conduct a regulatory flexibility analysis. Let's turn now to whether and how RIAs and other analyses are published in the project countries and the United States. In Colombia, the explanatory report, which contains the regulatory analysis, that's published by the agency issuing the regulation on its website. The regulatory docket, including the RIA if required, will be published on SUCO once that's operational. In Costa Rica, the RIA is published on SUCOPRI. In Mexico, the RIA is published on Syria. In Peru, the description of motivation, which contains the agency's regulatory analysis, is published on the agency website. In the US, the RIA is published in the rulemaking docket on regulations.gov. Two other noteworthy elements of regulatory analysis. In Colombia, in cases where a regulation would add or, or modify an administrative burden, the regulator must prepare written justification, including information on the costs to regulated entities, the budget and staff needed to implement the requirement, and a flowchart containing a description of the burden, including the steps it entails and the timing. Function Publica needs to review this and approve the addition or modification for the regulation to move forward. So there are some similarities here to an information collection request in the United States in that particular Colombian requirement. 
In Costa Rica, one interesting requirement is that the regulator needs to explain how it will evaluate the effectiveness of a regulation in achieving its objectives. And this is a key question to be asking for improving the quality of regulation, as well as the odds of a successful retrospective review system. It's important to put tools in place from the outset to, me to measure whether you are achieving your objectives or not. For example, are you achieving the benefits you expected? Does the regulation cost more than you expected? And if you are not achieving your objectives, you will have a stronger basis for revising the regulation if you know how you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of the regulation from the outset. The next set of GRPs relates to science. Whether an agency is using sound science and valid and reliable data and taking a risk-based approach to regulation. First, when assessing risks to health, safety, and the environment, an agency should use the best reasonably obtainable scientific methodologies, information, data, and weight of the available scientific evidence and state explicitly its assumptions, defaults, and uncertainties, and set out the rationale for these decisions and how they may influence the assessment of risk. Risk assessment should be peer-reviewed to help ensure the highest professional standards, and the central coordinating body should develop a peer review policy for regulatory agencies to follow. A good rulemaking process also provides guidance to regulators on how to gather valid and reliable data and holds regulators accountable for using sound scientific methods and analysis that are generally accepted within the scientific community to guide regulatory design. This would include ensuring that any relevant data that is valid and reliable is placed in the rulemaking docket. Gathering facts and using sound science leads to fact-based decision-making and better regulatory results. When crafting regulations, which is about how to manage the risk, it is important as a general matter to take a risk-based approach rather than a hazard-based approach. Having no control for risk represents real dangers to achieving important regulatory outcomes. At the same time, efforts to eliminate all risk through regulation results in regulatory foreclosure, stifles innovation, and results in a drag on the economy. Good regulatory practices impose disciplines on the regulatory process to carefully identify, quantify, and characterize the risks involved by substances or activities, including how those risks relate to other risks within the agency's ambit, and develop risk assessments where appropriately. Separately, GRPs ensure that agencies can calibrate the appropriate approach to risk management that reduces these risks. In general, this is an area science and risk policy that is not as developed in the project countries as other areas that we examined. So in Mexico, a regulator must perform a risk analysis when the results of the RIA calculator require it, and that includes all regulations that need a high impact RIA. The RIA manual encourages a regulator to include in its analysis the data supporting its assertions and the sources. In the United States, Pursuant to executive orders and guidance, regulators are encouraged to base regulations on the best reasonably obtainable scientific information and make supporting documentation publicly available. Consider how a regulation would reduce risks to health, safety, and the environment, ensure objectivity of scientific information and processes used to support regulations, perform risk assessments for significant draft regulations, and rely on peer-reviewed information and risk assessments. Some country policies in the region are at an early stage and they're focused on technical regulations. So in Colombia, as of January 2018, agencies need to prepare an RIA that includes a risk analysis for all technical regulations. So that's a new requirement. In Costa Rica, agencies are encouraged through guidance from the Ministry of Economy to conduct a risk analysis when analyzing the impact of a draft technical regulation, to consider data quality, and to use a risk-based approach when environment, health, and safety are at stake. International standards and standards developed by recognized agencies are presumed 
to have solid scientific support, which is key in Costa Rica. In addition, DMR is working to develop an RIA form for technical regulations that would include risk analysis. In Peru, measures that may affect plant or animal health need to be based on a technical and scientific analysis. The next GRP is the need to conduct a competition analysis. Regulation could potentially have an adverse impact on the market, picking winners and losers. It can prevent market entry and favor larger players over smaller ones. For this reason, looking at regulatory design through a competition lens as part of the regulatory process can be helpful in avoiding regulations that result in a stagnant economy. So now turning to the five countries. Some of the countries we studied require regulators to conduct such a formal analysis. Others do not. However, competition issues can still be examined as part of the regulatory review process. In the United States, such an analysis is required for significant regulations. You need to look at the pro-competitive impacts. In Colombia, a pro-competitive analysis is also required when the results of the preliminary studies indicate that a draft regulation will cause an economic impact. And as background, uh, the preliminary studies are a part of the analysis that a Colombian regulator puts together as it develops a proposed regulation. So in Colombia, when a draft regulation will cause an economic impact, SIC, which is Colombia's National Competition Authority, also reviews and issues a non-binding opinion. The regulator can disregard it, but it will need to explain its reasoning. SIC's opinion will be part of the package that the Office of the President reviews before signature, so they will see it even though it's non-binding. In Mexico, as you mentioned before, a competition analysis is required when the RIA calculator determines that a regulator needs to perform a competition impact analysis. And CONAMER informs uh, the Competition Commission of Mexico of any draft regulations with a competition impact analysis so that it can review them and offer its views and recommendations. And the Competition Commission can also require such an analysis if the RIA calculator failed to detect a potential impact on competition. In Costa Rica, a pro-competitive analysis is not required, but DMR sends measures to the Ministry of Economy's Competition Office for its analysis and issuance of a non-binding opinion. In Peru, a competition analysis is also not required, but the Ministry of Economy and Finance may examine competition issues when it reviews a draft measure. The next GRP is assessment of international impact. The regulatory process needs to recognize the degree to which a proposed regulation will have international impacts. Supply chains are sophisticated and global in nature. As a result, a regulator can't develop regulations without considering the increasingly important international dimension, which needs to be built into regulatory design. Agencies must also be sure that regulatory actions comply with all international obligations, such as the TBT agreement, and they should seek to minimize unnecessary differences between their rules and rules of major trading partners. And this could all come into play as part of an international impact assessment. Now, some of the countries we study require regulators to conduct such an international impact assessment. Others do not but such issues can still be examined as part of the review process. So similar to what we found on the pro-competitive analysis side. In Colombia, regulators are required to conduct an international impact analysis when the draft regulation could have an international impact or if it's a technical regulation. In Mexico, Mexico requires such an analysis when the RIA calculator determines that a regulator needs to perform a foreign trade impact analysis. Costa Rica does not require such an analysis, but ORT reviews draft measures for potential international commitments and to ensure compliance with them during the regulatory process. A international impact assessment is not required in either Peru or the United States, but trade ministries can weigh in 
during the regulatory process where a draft regulation has international trade implications. And in the United States, agencies must publicly identify any significant regulations that have significant international impacts for posting on OIRA's dashboard where all the rules under review are listed. Another important GRP is the use of technical standards in regulation. Governments are encouraged to maximize their use of relevant international standards or their relevant parts wherever possible as a basis for regulation and to make normative reference to such standards in lieu of creating government unique rules. Governments also need to send their technical experts to participate actively in international standards development. Agencies must comply with WTO rules on standards related measures. And we talked about the TBT agreement earlier, and that includes a commitment to use relevant international standards as a basis for technical regulations. It's also important for countries to provide their regulators with guidance on standards related international commitments and on factors for evaluating standards for use in regulation so that they select an appropriate standard or standards to adopt or reference. Among the five countries, there are differences in approach on what constitutes an international standard. In the United States, an international standard is any standard developed in accordance with the WTO TBT committee principles, transparency, openness, impartiality, and consensus, effectiveness and relevance, coherence, and the development dimension. Those are the six principles of the WTO TBT committee decision. In Mexico, the committee decision is official policy, but the emphasis is on ISO and IEC standards, and the use depends on the agency. Now, it's possible this could change through Mexican trade agreements, such as CPTPP, and a renegotiated NAFTA or U.S.-Mexico bilateral trade agreement. In Costa Rica and Peru, there is a hierarchy of standards. Certain standards are recognized as international, and those are essentially Geneva-based bodies such as ISO and IEC, and intergovernmental bodies such as Codex. The next level down in this hierarchy is regional standards, and that's followed by national standards, and finally, association and private sector standards. In Colombia, regulators are required to use international standards that have been adopted by international organizations. There's no hierarchy, but the terms international standard and international organization are undefined. So other standards policies of note of the, the five countries. So standards policy in the United States is set out in OMB Circular A119, which was issued by OIRA. And that provides guidance for agencies on how to participate in standards development, select the appropriate standard and conformity assessment procedure, reference standards, report on their use of standards, comply with international standards related obligations, and implement the circular through their standards executives, who are the standards leads for each agency. In Mexico, DGN recognizes 10 Mexican standards bodies, each with a specific scope, to develop NMXs, which are voluntary standards that can be referenced in regulation. In Costa Rica, for any draft technical regulation, a regulator needs to prepare a study to determine whether the relevant international standard or standards should be adopted in whole or in part. If the regulator doesn't want to utilize a relevant international standard or part of the standard, there is a high evidentiary hurdle to justify that decision. So the hierarchy of standards bodies in Costa Rica has real ramifications for regulatory outcomes. Next, let's discuss the GRP for entry into force. When order to permit stakeholders to become aware of new regulations or changes to existing ones, regulators need to allow a reasonable period of time usually not less than six months between publication of the final rule and its entry into force. In general, the countries we examined provide for a longer transition period for technical regulations 
than for other types of regulations. So for non-technical regulations, there is no requir requirement to provide a transition period in Costa Rica, Colombia, or Mexico. In Peru, the transition period is at least 30 days. By contrast, for technical regulations, in Colombia, you need to provide at least 90 days after WTO notification. Peru, at least 180 days after WTO notification. In Costa Rica, it's an administrative custom to provide 180 days. In Mexico, you must provide at least 60 days for NOMS, but it could be 180 days if required by international commitments. Now, in the United States, as mentioned earlier, there's no distinction between technical regulations and non-technical regulations. You need to provide at least 30 days before regulators enter into force. However, Circular A119 notes that consistent with law and international obligations, there should be a reasonable interval between publication of a final rule and its effective date. So this is a nod to the TBT committee recommendations of normally not less than six months. The next GRP is judicial review. Once a regulatory action is finalized, it's imperative that interested stakeholders be permitted an opportunity to request independent judicial review of that action. Independent judicial review ensures that the regulator followed relevant procedures and that the regulatory action is the result of reasoned decision-making supported by valid and reliable evidence. It was promulgated in accordance with applicable law and it was not an abuse of agency discretion. In Colombia, Costa Rica, and the United States, judicial review of regulations is provided. Costa Rica also provides a mechanism for challenging a regulation with the head of the issuing agency. In Mexico, judicial review is not explicitly provided for, but regulations are regularly challenged in court. In Peru, there is no judicial review. However, Peru's National Consumer Protection Authority, or INDICOPI, maintains a bureaucratic barrier elimination process that private parties can use to challenge a specific measure. Lastly, let's discuss ex post review. Good regulatory practices also need to extend to regulations that have gone into effect. In addition to ex post review, the practice of reviewing existing regulations is sometimes referred to as regulatory look back, retrospective review, or fitness check. Regulations have life cycles. Challenges arise, regulations are drafted and opposed, and those regulations have an impact. As time passes, new challenges arise and the regulatory process repeats itself. A cutting edge regulatory process puts equal emphasis on ex post evaluation of regulation and ex ante regulatory design. This approach increases a regulator's understanding of how the regulated community responds to regulation. It puts the regulator in a position to course correct its regulatory decisions so that it can modify, streamline, or eliminate outdated, inconsistent, and inefficient regulations and put in place higher quality regulations. It also better informs future ex ante impact assessments. For an ex post regulatory look back to be effective, the agency must collect and maintain data and information on its experience in implementing the regulation as well as industry's experience in complying with the regulation, including both costs and benefits. Implementation of ex post review varied widely among the five countries that we examined. In Costa Rica, it is required, but there's no set time period in which it must be done. However, Costa Rica has an interesting requirement as part of its regulatory analysis. As I mentioned earlier, a regulator needs to explain how it will evaluate the effectiveness of a regulation in achieving its objectives. This could be helpful as a tool for enabling ex post review. In the United States, ex post review is also required, but OIRA emphasizes um, ex post review in an intermittent fashion, and it also, uh, the emphasis varies by administration. So retrospective review initiatives have been across the board. They co they've covered all regulations, 
or they focused on a, a specific type of measure, such as paperwork or reporting burden reduction, or on a particular sector, such as maritime, or a particular context, such as the U.S.-Canada Regulatory Cooperation Council. The current administration initiative on regulatory budgeting should provide an incentive for agencies to engage in more ex post review to offset the cost of new regulations. In Mexico, ex post review is required, but only for NOMs with a high impact IRA, and that review has to happen every five years. For Colombia and Peru, ex post review is required only for technical regulations, although Colombia plans to extend it to all rules. And in both countries, this is very new. In Peru, ex post review is required every three years, and the first reports are due at the end of this year, the end of 2018. In Colombia, ex post review is required every five years, and if a technical regulation is not reviewed by the deadline, it expires. And the first deadline is January 1st, 2019. So Colombian regulators right now are reviewing rules that were issued prior to 2014. So as you probably noticed by now, there is a lot going on in all these countries when it comes to regulatory development and many recent initiatives that are now just being rolled out. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they're implemented and what comes next. Here's some of the biggest things to watch. Probably the most interesting development is Mexico's general law on regulatory improvement, which was signed in May, and if and how the new Mexican administration will implement it. We discussed the general law in more detail during the Mexico webinar, but in general, it strengthens central coordination in Mexico significantly and attempts to apply central coordination disciplines to state and municipal regulations in a very ambitious and unprecedented way. Second issue is, will there be growth in international regulatory cooperation through free trade agreements, such as Pacific Alliance and CPTPP, and potentially through regional activities, such as Andean community technical regulations or technical regulations in the Central American context. Third, we'll be following regulatory budgeting implementation in both the United States and Mexico, as well as its impact on ex post review. We'll be watching Costa Rica's OECD accession process to see whether that will lead to additional changes in the regulatory process there. We'll be following Colombia's evolution on regulatory coherence, the development of the SUCOP website to enhance transparency. And we'll be waiting to see whether OMR's role will be elevated to that of a true central coordinating body. Lastly, it'll be interesting to see how Colombia and Peru's ambitious ex post assessment schemes work. So thanks very much for watching this webinar. I know it was a lot of material to digest. Thanks also to Advermed and ANSI for making this all possible, and to Aguiar Iluera in Mexico City, which provided invaluable assistance to Venable on this project. In closing, I would like to note that the webinar is posted on the Standards Alliance website, standardsalliance.ansi.org, along with other related webinars in this series. You'll also be able to find there in English and Spanish, the Manual and Implementation Guide on Good Regulatory Design, the complete analyses of the regulatory systems of the four project countries, Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru, and Colombia, along with the United States, documents that set out the life cycle of a regulation in each of the five countries, and the slide decks and transcripts from all of the webinars. If after reviewing the materials, you have additional questions or would like to discuss further, please feel free to contact me. My contact information is on the last slide. Thanks very much. Have a great day.